Okay. Zoom just added this feature of saying this meeting is being recorded. I uh, didn't used to do that. So um, uh, I, I wanted to point out, welcome everybody to uh, the Torah study session today on May 26th, where the portion is Beha'alotacha, found in our, uh, just one second, let me let one person in. <clears throat> And uh, good morning. The portion this week is Beha Alotacha, and in Eitz Chaim, we're on page 816. Whatever edition of Chumash you have at home, uh, look for the third portion in the book of Numbers, which begins chapter 8. Chapter 8 of the book of Numbers. And I, I wanted to point out that today will be our uh, last session because I, I would have to cancel next week anyway, the first Wednesday in June, because I'll be out of, out of town. But um, we will pick up again probably mid-August. The uh, holidays are early this year. Um, so I'm already starting to be in high holiday mode. So, um, so we'll resume the class. Uh, there'll be an email that will go out, obviously, that uh, when all the classes are going to be resuming. So um, we'll take a, a, a brief hiatus for, for a few weeks. Um, so uh, again, the portion is Baha Alotacha, uh, page 816 and 8 Chaim, chapter 8 of the Book of Numbers. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Sherkitshana B'mitzvotah B'tzivanu La'asok B'divrei Torah. There are a number of topics that our portion um, discusses this week, and we're not going to get to all of them. But I wanted to uh, to start with the very first one, which is the arguably one of the more famous sections here, and the Haftarah that's chosen for this portion chooses this uh, topic uh, as, uh, as the Haftorah. So uh, let me just read it in the Hebrew and translate it as I go. By Daber Adonai El Moshe Lemor, God spoke to Moses saying, Daber El Aharon, speak to Aaron, Va'amarta Elav, and say to him, Beha'alotacha etanei rot, when you raise up, or when you bring up the candles, okay? That's how I would translate it. The, uh, the Eitz Chaim says, when you mount the lamps. Okay, I, I translated it as candles only because in modern Hebrew, ner is candle. But in rabbinic Hebrew um, and in Torah and biblical Hebrew, uh, ner can be anything that contains the fire. In other words, the fire itself would have a different word. Fire is ash. Anything that carries the fire, like a torch or a piece of wood or a wick um, or a candle could be called a nair. Okay, so, so in modern Hebrew, a nair specifically is a candle, a, a wax candle. Um, and the other, uh, 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 there's a different word for a wick and a different word for a torch. Um, but in biblical Hebrew, ner would be any of those things. Okay, so when you mount, and they, so here it's called a lamp. When you mount the lamps, um, el mul pene ha menorah, in front of the menorah. So when you, um, now that's interesting. The English leaves that phrase out. El, no, that's not right. They put it at the end. The front of the lamp stand. That's el mul peneha menorah, the front of the lamp stand. So they're translating menorah, which really for most Jews doesn't need a translation. And in fact, it's probably in the Oxford Dictionary, menorah. Um, so it's uh, just a candelabra. 
So uh, candelabrum, <laughs> to make it singular, a candelabrum, right? So it's, it's not a Hanukkah menorah, which has nine branches. This is just a regular menorah, which tell Yairu Shivat Hanerot. Uh, the, um, the seven lamps will give light. Okay, so it's an awkward phrasing. So let me translate the whole sentence again. Speak to Aaron and say to him, when you uh, bring up the candles in front of the menorah, they will light the seven candles or the can seven candles will light. So the English translation ref uh, that I just did reflects the awkward sense of the Hebrew. So that's why the new the translation of Eitz Chaim fixes it and says, when you mount the lamps, let the seven lamps give light at the front of the lampstand. So what does that mean? Like do you, you have these seven branches of a menorah and then the candles are in front of the menorah? Shouldn't they be in the menorah? Okay, so verse three, Vaya'as kena haron, Aaron did so. So he must have understood Moses's directions by God. It's, it sounds almost like, and not to be disparaging or insulting, it sounds like an Ikea, an Ikea uh, instruction, right? If you're putting something together that you buy from Ikea, there aren't even words there. There are just um, pictures. Or if you buy, I've done this. I have bought a, like a cheap digital watch for $10. And it comes with instructions that are clearly translated from the Chinese or the Japanese in very literal way. And the English really doesn't make too much sense uh, because it's, it's, <laughs> it's someone in Japan or China writing the directions and then clicking on Google Translate and then just printing it without fixing it and having no idea what the English should be to make it make sense. Um, <laughs> if somebody posts on Facebook every now and then funny translations of signs in Hebrew. Uh, and there was one, <laughs> there was one uh, that was posted the other day. Zihirut, caution, warning, borot misukanim, which should be translated as dangerous pits or holes in the ground, but it's translated as dangerous, ignorant people. <laughs> because in rabbinic Hebrew, a boar is an ignoramus. So really, it's on the sign that, that is in front of an archeological site and just translated dangerous, ignorant people in front of you or something like that. So you wonder who's in charge of the signs and why do they let such a, a, a gross mistake um, be published on a sign? And it, it happens all the time. So anyway, so here, um, this translation is hard um, and, and reflects the awkward sense of the Hebrew because we're not exactly sure where these candles are supposed to be going, where are these um, um, fiery lights supposed to be. But Aaron did so, Vayas Kena Haron, El Mul Peneha Menorah He'elan Neiroteha. In front of the menorah, he raised up its candles. Okay? Now, it could simply be that he raised up the lights and put them into the candle holders because the menorah that was possibly used at that time in the Mishkan and later in the temple in Jerusalem, if you can picture the menorah, if you've ever been to the Knesset in Jerusalem and right outside the security gate before you even enter into the plaza to get into the Knesset, right there on the road, where the tour bus would leave you off, or the taxi cab would leave you off, is a huge menorah. Now that could be the life-size menorah that was used in the temple in Jerusalem itself, just a, an artistic uh, representation of it. If you walk in the old city of Jerusalem in the, um, in the uh, Jewish quarter, 
on your way to the um, on your way to the Kotel. So you're walking. There are there are two ways to get to the Kotel. You can either go through the Shuk. Well, you you start through the the Shuk from Jaffa Road, but if you keep going straight, there's a way to get there. Or you turn right to get into the Jewish quarter, and you go through uh, the residences there, and then lots of shops, and you keep going. And then there's like the last restaurant, and then there are stairs that you start to go down slowly, uh, like different landings along the way. As you start, there's a glass case that has a gold menorah in it. So there's another representation of the menorah itself. It's big. It's, it's, it's about six feet tall, the menorah. Okay, so you can picture Aaron then raising up the lights to put it into the menorah. It's not like a Hanukkah menorah that you just have on the table in front of you and there's no raising of lights. You're putting it there because it's a, it's a tiny thing. But the menorah that was in the, the Mishkan and later in the temple in Jerusalem was big and you had to raise up your arm, uh, if not get on a step to put the light in there. Okay, so that's what Aaron did, verse three. Um, as God commanded Moses. Uh, four, this is how the menorah is made. Miksha uh, Zahav, beaten, beaten gold, uh, or hammered work of gold. Ad Yerecha, Ad Pircha, Miksha He, hammered from base to petal. Okay, pircha, its petal or its flower. Again, we don't know how it looked. Um, there is a midrash, it's, I'm not sure it's here below the line, that God actually, uh, in front of Moses' eyes, showed him how the menorah was supposed to be fashioned. And from that, Moses fashioned it. Okay, so that each, um, each candle, the each candle holder, like my hand is a candle holder now, would be shaped like a flower. And that the candle or the light would be inside the flower. And it's made of gold. Okay, so uh, from the base, uh, yerech, the base, to the petal, uh, the flower petal, mikshahi, it is beaten, gold, kamar eh, Asher her a Adonai at Moshe, as the uh, picture that God that God showed Moses, Cain asa et menorah. That is how he made the menorah. Okay, so all we know about the menorah, it's made of gold. It has seven branches, and um, it the base in which the fire would be going the candle would be going, looked like a flower. That's all we know from the description right here. Okay, now, um, below the line has some midrash about this. The menorah, originally one, uh, one among many objects in the tent of meeting, has become one of the most familiar symbols of Judaism. Okay, now if we were to say what's a symbol of Judaism, we might say the Jewish star. Right, so people people wear Magen David necklaces. They don't wear Menorah necklaces. So Jewish star, but even older than the Jewish star is the Menorah as a symbol. More than a thousand years after the time of Aaron, the Menorah became the symbol of Aaron's descendants, the Hasmoneans, who reclaimed the Temple of Jerusalem after the Maccabees' victory. Right, so the Maccabees' victory, which is celebrated by, uh, on Hanukkah every year, uh, the whole idea of of that that we celebrate is light, lighting the Hanukkah menorah, and that's because the Maccabees, the legend goes, only cleaned out the temple, purified it again after ridding it of the Greek idols in it, uh, and they found only one little jar of pure olive oil and to light the, the entire menorah. 
and it would only last one day, and the miracle lasted eight days. So that's why the menorah, according to, as the commentary is presenting it here, um, becomes the, the symbol uh, of Hanukkah, which was about a thousand years uh, or more, actually, after, after this commandment. In parentheses here, today we use an eight-branched menorah, <clears throat> now known more precisely as a Hanukkiah, to commemorate the eight days of Hanukkah of the Hanukkah miracle. The menorah described here is seven-branched. <clears throat> so there is that, that distinction. There is a distinction between a menorah, which we use also to call a Hanukkah menorah, we would simply say menorah for that, but technically speaking, a menorah is the seven-branched menorah, a Hanukkiah is the nine-branched menorah, right? The shamash having its own uh, holder, plus the eight other branches for the eight days of Hanukkah. And it depends on how your menorah is made, your Hanukkah menorah is made, either that shamash goes in the middle with four on either side, or it could be on the far end with eight alongside of it, right? The tradition is they all have to be on the same level, uh, but the shamash a little bit higher than the other eight. Um, but there are many artistic versions of Hanukkah menorahs that have the candles all different sh shapes and, and sizes and, and, and heights. But that's a, this, a discussion for another time. Um, but the menorah, <clears throat> back, back uh, to our commentary here, the menorah carried off by the Roman soldiers in a victory parade is featured in a carving on the Arch of Titus in Rome, which celebrates the defeat of the Jews in 70 CE. Now, if you ever had the opportunity to be uh, in Rome, outside the Colosseum of Rome, there's a whole uh, archeological park there with a whole variety of um, monuments and arches and things like that. Uh, near the end of that park, closest to the Colosseum, is the Arch of Titus from 2000 years ago. So remarkably great condition. And inside the arch are a lot of sculptural reliefs. And near the bottom is the famous relief. If just Google Arch of Titus menorah, you'll see the picture of that uh, where the soldiers are actually carrying uh, loot from the temple in Jerusalem. And one of the soldiers has the menorah <clears throat> over his shoulder. So it's big, but it's not necessarily six feet tall. But that's, so is that an accurate depiction of what the menorah looked like? We don't know. Like, was an artist commissioned at the time to make an arch and just told, hey, make a, make a picture of soldiers carrying stuff. Or was the stuff on display <clears throat> for the average Roman to see? To say, hey, here's, here's the loot from the destroyed uh, Jewish province of uh, Judea and their temple. Take a look. So maybe it was, we don't know. Our archaeologi our archaeologists and historians don't know for sure. But that's one of the oldest depictions of the menorah. The, the, uh, right, uh, then the comment goes on. Uh, 19 centuries later, the seven branch menorah became the seal of the state of Israel. Recalling the bush that burned but was not consumed, the light of the menorah would never be permanent, permanently extinguished. Okay, so the menorah representing God's presence, maybe representing the um, the Jewish people themselves, that we would never be destroyed. Uh, uh, there's also uh, <clears throat> tombstones have been found also from 2000 years ago, both in Rome and in Israel with menorahs on them, right? So if you go to any Jewish cemetery today that has tombstones, not just the, the brass marker that's on the ground, but an actual tombstone, there are a number of 
traditional images that would be on a tombstone. So of course there would be a Jewish star on it, but more often than not, there would be a menorah on it as well. And if someone's a Kohen, there would be hands on it that would look like this because this is how the Kohen's hands look when they bless the congregation. So if you go to such a Jewish cemetery that has tombstones, you'll see this symbol if, some, if they were a Kohen. If they were a Levi, you would see a water pitcher as a symbol on the tombstone because that's the, 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 the job of the Levi is to wash the hands and feet of the Kohanim. Uh, and there would be other, other symbols like that, but th those are the most common symbols that you would find on tombstones today. It is remarkable, but right. so I've, I've been to Rome and I've been to the, the museum that's in the Vatican. And the museum in the Vatican <clears throat> has a section of Judaica. And in this section of Judaica are pieces of, or either they're, I think they're replicas of tombstones, Jewish tombstones. So there, there are inscriptions on the tombstones written in Latin uh, of, uh, you know, here lies so-and-so, and it has pic these engravings on it with, with menorahs on it. So it's quite, quite remarkable to see how uh, constant uh, a symbol the menorah is. Okay, so there, there's that about the menorah. Then the, the commentary goes on to, to describe more of the symbolism of the menorah. Isaac Luria, who was a, a mystic from the city of Tzvat, and in the in the 1500s taught that the six branches of the menorah represent the several scientific and academic disciplines whereas the center stalk represents the light of the torah okay so for this idea for luria you have torah being in the middle and the other three branches on either side are other scientific uh, academic pursuits, areas of, of uh, research, and all are dependent on Torah, according to Isaac Luria. Secular learning and faith are not rivals. Each has its own concerns and addresses its own set of questions. They shed light on each other, and together they illumine our world. So according to Isaac Luria, it's also the, the motto of Yeshiva University, Torah umada, Torah and science. So in other words, the, the, uh, the um, Maimonides advocated this idea, Luria a couple hundred years later advocated this idea that uh, you, one, a Jew is supposed to learn everything there is to learn about the world. And that as one does so, one would find remarkably how it coincides with Torah. So a religious Jew will learn about the world and ensure that it doesn't threaten a knowledge of Torah. And at the same time, that the knowledge of Torah should not uh, be a knowledge that hides or sweeps under the carpet scientific knowledge. So in other words, how do you reconcile uh, dinosaur fossils with the book of Genesis, which doesn't list dinosaurs as, uh, as animals. A actually, it doesn't list uh, too many animals to begin with. So since it doesn't list animals at all, well, okay, you can, uh, well, the bigger question is Adam and Eve archaeologically could not have existed more than 5,000, 6,000 years ago. And dinosaurs were millions and millions of years ago. So how do you reconcile the Torah being from 6,000 years ago when it describes the creation of the world, which would have been millions and millions and millions of years ago, right? So a, um, an easy way to reconcile that is that we're the Torah is concerned about human history, not about uh, the Earth's history. And the fact that it doesn't have dinosaurs in it, it doesn't have cavemen in it, it doesn't have woolly mammoths in it, etc., is of no concern 
what difference does that make? The concern is people who are finally able to communicate with one another and being able to uh, create society, that's what Torah is about. Okay, that's just a tangent about how Torah and science can work together as pictured on the menorah. Torah in the middle, shedding light on and sharing the light with other scientific pursuits. Okay, and then the last paragraph of this comment, why does the Torah lay such emphasis on the menorah among all the furnishings of the Tent of Meaning, right? So we have a description of it back in the book of Exodus and why, why another description of it here? As I shine the light on Israel, making them conspicuous among the nations, let them shine a light on me from the Midrash on the book of Numbers. So it's a way, the menorah is a way for us to show how we want to ensure that God maintains a constant presence in our lives. So instead of waiting for God to appear or having faith that God is there, when we light the menorah, we are showing that God is there. And that by lighting the menorah every single day, Aaron is saying, yes, God is here. And we're ensuring that people know and continue to understand that uh, and have faith that God is here. The commentary goes on. God has no visible form. Only when Jews live by the values of the Torah do they embody what God stands for and make God manifest in the world. For the modern traditional Jew, the doctrine of the election and covenant of Israel offers a purpose for Jewish existence, which transcends narrow self-interest. It obligates us to build a just and compassionate society throughout the world, and especially in the land of Israel, where we may teach by both personal and collective example what it means to be a covenant people, a light to the nation. So when we light the menorah, we're also showing that uh, fulfilling this idea of being a light unto the nations. Okay, so that's that's what I wanted to, um, to share about the menorah. Let's see if we have uh, how much more time we will have. Uh, the next thing I wanted to look at <clears throat> is chapter nine. So turn ahead just uh, another page to eight, page 819. Uh, so the beginning of chapter nine, what's listed here is a third Aliyah. So here's this interesting uh, story uh, or event about Passover. El Moshe, God spoke to Moses, Bar Sinai in the wilderness of Sinai, Hashenit, let's say Tameretz Mitzrayim in the second year after their exodus from the land of Egypt, Bachodesh Harishon Lemor in the first month, saying. Uh, just one second. I just want to see something for sure because I have in my mind. Yes, the book of Numbers begins in the second month of that year. If we if we just just turn back to 769. Keep your keep your finger here, but turn back to page 769 to chapter one of the book of Numbers. God spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai at the tent of meeting in the first of the second month the first of the second month. That's chapter one. Now, chapter nine. God spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the second year leaving from leaving Egypt in the first month, saying, whoa, what, what's, why isn't this the beginning of the book of Numbers? Why are we going back in time? All right, there's there's no answer to this question in the commentary. Uh, just a second. Yeah. It's it's interesting. The commentary does not point this out, but uh, which is fascinating to me. Maybe they assume that people forgot what chapter one said. The rabbis did not forget this. And for the rabbis, it doesn't matter that it's out of order because the rabbis say, Ein mukdam Torah. There's no early or late in the Torah. So chronology that we might expect, right? If we were to, if we were writing the Torah and we put this chapter nine here, 
instead of at the beginning, because this is happening in the first month, but the beginning of the book happened in the second month, an editor would say, hmm, maybe you should reorder what's here uh, in your book. So for some reason, the editors of the Torah uh, decided to put the order this way. And everything from the beginning of the book is essentially getting set up, uh, reminding us how the people were set up in, um, in the desert at the foot of Mount Sinai, right? It started with a census, a uh, census of the Israelites, census of the tribe of Levi, uh, how they were situa situated around the tent of meeting and, and describing in great detail uh, the three tribes that are on each side of the rectangle of the tent of meeting, right? We have that. We have a few other laws that are presented. And now we're almost ready for the people to start moving. And perhaps that's why the, the book goes out of order here. Okay? So, verse 2. And the people of Israel did Passover at its set time, at the right time. They observed Passover. So it's the, it, it's, the sec, it's the second year after leaving Egypt. So in other words, it's exactly a year after leaving Egypt. Time to observe Passover. That's what they're doing. On the 14th day of this month, Bain Harbaim at twilight, Tasu Otoba Mawado, they did it at its right time, Kehol Hukotav, Uchahol Mishpatav, Tasu Oto, according to all its rules and rights, they did it. Okay? Four, Vaidaber Moshe El Bene Yisrael, La Soda Pasach, Moses spoke to the people of Israel to do Passover. And they did Passover on the first, on the 14th day of the month, at twilight, in the wilderness of Sinai, according to everything that God commanded Moses, so did the people of Israel. Okay, they observed Passover. Six. But there were people who were impure. They were impure by having come into contact with the dead. And they couldn't do Passover by Yomahu on that day. And they came close before Moses and before Aaron by Yomahu on that day. Right? So impure people, impure by reason of having come into contact with a corpse. And, and we know that uh, anybody who is impure is not allowed to offer the Passover sacrifice. So they come close to Moses. They approach Moses. They approach Moses. So that's a better way to say it than to come close because you're not supposed to come into contact with anybody who has come into contact with a corpse. So by approaching, they are within respectable or the, the, the appropriate distance. Verse 7, Vayomru ha'anashim ha'hema, those people said, a love to him, anachnu tmeim l'nefesh adam. We are impure by reason of contact with a corpse. Lama nigara l'vilti ha'kri korban Adonai. Why would we be prevented from offering the sacrifice of God, b'mo'ado, at its time, b'toch b'nei Yisrael, among the people of Israel. In other words, why, why are we to be held back just because we're impure? Vayomer alehem Moshe, Moses said to them, imdu ve'eshma'ah, stand here, and I'll hear, ma'yetzeveh Adonai lachem, what God will command you. Okay, so let me, let me make sure we understand the situation here. Passover is about to be observed. These people, we don't know how many, are impure by reason of contact with a corpse. They're not allowed to offer the Passover sacrifice. So instead of saying, we can't do it, they actually are proactive and, and go to Moses and say, hey, what can we do? Moses doesn't answer them directly. 
he doesn't give them an answer. Well, too bad. Or make up an answer, a different answer. No, he says, hold on. Let me, let me talk to God. So this is fascinating. This is the first time of several times that God, Moses, will do this in the book of Numbers. Ha hang on a second. Let me check with God instead of giving an answer himself. So I, I just want to point that out, that that's a, a fascinating thing about Moses, that he, he knew the law and he was able to teach the law. But if someone had a question that he that was not readily accessible by means of understanding the law itself. And I would I would venture to say the answer is it is easily accessible. Moses could have said to them, no, you can't do it. You miss out on it this year. Maybe next year you'll be better off and you'll so we'll just miss it this year. Moses could have said that, but he didn't say that. He said, let me see what God would say. And perhaps God will say, too bad, but let's see what happens. I think this, just the, this idea, this approach that Moses has, if people have a question and out of a desire to do something to participate in the community ritual, Moses here um, understand, uh, has the, um, or sets the stage for us that he doesn't give up on the people. He said, well, I'll see what I can do. Let me ask God. It's God's law. God wants to change the law. Well, it's up to God to do that. But let me ask him. So, verse 9, God spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the people of Israel saying, Any person who's impure by reason of touching a corpse, Oh, or is far away. So God adds another condition. The original condition that the people brought is impurity. God said, you know what? I'll up you one. Not only will you, anybody who's impure, have a second chance, but anybody who was far away. So God adds an extra layer to this for people who might miss out on the Passover sacrifice. It's not just impurity that you can miss out, but also if you're far away. Uh, um, so not just this time, but in any generation. So this is the, the rule going forward. Anybody impure by means of contact with a corpse or anybody too far away, to be able to bring the Passover sacrifice to the Mishkan or to bring the Passover sacrifice to the temple in Jerusalem, right? This is, there's no such thing as too far away today in observing Passover because the temple doesn't exist. So we observe Passover by having a Seder. You can have a Seder anywhere, right? The excuse, it's too far for me to go home to make the Seder with mom and dad or grandma and grandpa, that's not an excuse for not doing Passover. Passover can be done anywhere now. But when the temple's in Jerusalem, not only do we have the Seder, but we have to bring the Passover sacrifice in Jerusalem. So it's that distance from Jerusalem that matters. Okay? So distance from the temple <clears throat> or impurity by reason of a corpse. Then... Um, um, at, at, uh, this is how you can do the Passover to God. So verse 11, what's, what's the alternative? Um, um, just a second, I'm bringing up my chat. Uh, uh, right, so, uh, so, so Jan says, wasn't there this, uh, this thought uh, based on verse 11 going forward, that perhaps when we just started COVID, that we had no idea how long the pandemic was going to be around. It was clear that for Passover last year, not this, not eight weeks ago, nine weeks ago, but in 2020, when the pandemic first started, people were talking about, well, we have Pesach Sheni, maybe 
a month after Passover, we have this opportunity. By then, the pandemic will have gone away. Well, it didn't go away, so that wasn't an opportunity. So the Passover, the second Passover does not apply today in terms of if you miss a Seder, here's a second opportunity for a Seder. So second Passover is only on the calendar as a marker for when the Messiah will come and the temple will be rebuilt, that it will be an important day on the calendar if when the temple is rebuilt and we have to bring the Passover sacrifice, that we're impure at that time or we're too far away, that we have this date on the calendar for a second chance. That's the only time, that, that's the only significance of pass, second Passover today. The significance of it today on the calendar is that a couple of things in a weekday morning service are not said. To, re, to highlight that, if the temple were standing, it would be a holiday. So for those traditional Jews who recite a prayer known as Tachanun, these prayers of supplication that are recited after the Amidah, uh, we don't recite them. Most conservative synagogues don't do them. But if we did do them, we wouldn't recite them on, Pass on second Passover. And if a funeral were to happen, God forbid, the El Male, the traditional memorial prayer is not recited, a substitute memorial prayer is recited. So things like that liturgically are different. There's nothing else ritually that is done to mark Passover, second Passover. It's only for when the temple is standing in Jerusalem. Okay, so verse 11. Bachodesh Hasheni, in the second month, Passover is in the first month. In the second month, on the fourth, Ba'arba'asar Yom Ben Harabayim, on the 14th day, at twilight, Yasuoto, you make the Passover sacrifice, al matzot umrorim yochluhu. Eat it with matzah and bitter herbs. Okay, just like you would do it at the first time. Lo yashiru mimenarad boker, don't leave anything from that sacrifice until the morning. Don't break a bone in the Passover sacrifice. Like the laws of Passover, you do it in this second month. Vehaish, 13. And the person who is pure. And he wasn't traveling. And still did not offer the Passover sacrifice at the right time. Right time. The, the, the soul of that person will be cut off from his people. Because the a sacrifice to God was not offered at its right time. His, that person has to bear the responsibility for that sin. Okay, so, so by instituting the second Passover, God's saying, don't be lazy, people, because if you are lazy, saying, oh, I missed the first one, I could have done it, I was pure, I was in town, I just didn't get around to it. If that's your excuse for waiting to the second month, you don't have the second month to do it over again. You are uh, excommunicated from the people of Israel. Do it, you have to do it at the right time. It's only those two excuses that give you the opportunity uh, to have a, a do-over, okay? And I just wanna look at the comment below the line here on page 820. People who were ritually impure felt deprived at not being able to share in this central national reaff reaffirmation, right? Passover is all about uh, becoming the people Exodus from Egypt. They brought their problem to Moses, who in turn brought it to before God. God acknowledges their sincerity and grants them a second Pesach one month later. To the sincere individual, life often does not offer second chances for spiritual fulfillment that may have been missed when the opportunities first presented themselves. Right. So it's an unusual opportunity that the Torah grants here, a uh, second chance. And uh, most things don't have a second chance. If you, right, if you miss out on lighting the candles to start Shabbat, 
you don't have a second chance to do it. It's the right, there's a right time to do it and there's no makeup time. Uh, if you miss Sukkot, too bad. There's no other time to do Sukkot. Uh, if you forgot to say the prayer for eating and you already ate your meal, too late. You can't say the prayer before eating when it's already done. So most things don't have a second chance opportunity. But Passover, which is a national holiday that the, as the Torah describes with the appropriate sacrifices with it, the, for that holiday, you get a do-over. And um, so I think it's an interesting religious concept that, um, that our uh, tradition provides that um, we're not perfect and that there could be some things that um, impose upon our ability to uh, observe something uh, that depending on what it is, we have an opportunity to make up for it. Okay. And there's one other section I want to look at in the time that we have left. And this is on page 831. So we, uh, so this is the Passover sacrifice. Then we're told in chapter 10 that trumpets have to be fashioned and then how the people started, would start to move. That's chapter 10. And then um, Moses says goodbye to his father-in-law who has been with him this whole time. Father-in-law says, you know, you people are, you and the people are moving now. I'm going to bid farewell. Moses tries to convince him to stay, but he says, no, this is your journey, not mine. And then 826, uh, we have the phrases there at the beginning of the sixth Aliyah, verse 35, what is said when they start to move and what is said when they come to rest, which is what is said in the Torah service, which thank God, June 12th, we'll be able to recite again when we're back in the building and we take the Torah out of the ark. Um, that's that. Uh, chapter 11 begins with the people complaining. So as soon as they start to move, they start to complain about food and water uh, or about food. So Moses provides, uh, consults with God and provides uh, like quail come along. And then uh, page 831. Uh, just a second. Uh, right, uh, beginning with verse 24. I'm going to do this in English. Moses went out and reported, so 831, verse 24, chapter 11, verse 24. Moses went out and reported the words of the Lord to the people. He gathered 70 of the people's elders and stationed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in a cloud and spoke to him. He drew upon the spirit that was on him and put it upon the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they spoke in ecstasy, but did not continue. In other words, so Moses had these 70 elders who were uh, touched by God's presence and that enabled them to have the authority to speak uh, to the people, to teach the people. Verse 26, two men, one named Eldad and the other Medad, had remained in the camp, yet the spirit rested upon them. They were among those recorded, but they had not gone out to the tent, and they spoke in ecstasy in the camp. In other words, these two were left behind. Were they part of the 70? It seems so. But they were kind of straggling along. It wasn't clear exactly um, what, uh, whether they were really supposed to be part of the 70 or not. Um, and the speaking in ecstasy, ecstasy is how the Hebrew, like speaking prophecy, is translated here. It's the same word for a navi, which is a prophet. So a, a prophet speaks uh, because the prophet has had contact with God and is saying God's word to the people. So one translation, one, one key element of what it means to be a prophet is that the prophet is God's mouthpiece. And that as if God is using the prophet, him or herself, as a microphone, right? So imagine holding on to a microphone and speaking in it, and that is projecting your voice. So God is using the prophet to project God's voice to the people. That's a major role of the prophet, okay? So speaking in ecstasy here means that they are 
uh, speaking uh, God's words, literally. So now, verse 27, a you, uh, on 832, a youth ran out and told Moses, saying, Eldad and Medad are acting the prophet in the camp. They're speaking in ecstasy in the camp. And Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' attendant from his youth, spoke up and said, My Lord Moses, restrain them. Right, so something, Eldad and Medad apparently are doing something out of order. They're not with the 70 others. They're on their own doing this speaking, this prophesying. And maybe because they're doing it out of order, um, that uh, Joshua is suggesting to Moses to have them stop. They're not doing it the right way. People could be confused. But verse 29, this is the important line. But Moses said to him, are you wrought up on my account? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord put his spirit upon them. Right? So everybody should be able to achieve what Eldad and Medad are doing. Don't, don't lock them up. Don't stop them from doing this. I want all people to feel God's presence in such a way that they feel that they can speak or they have access to God and to God's words. Then Moses then re-entered the camp together with the elders of Israel. So this, this is a fascinating idea, too, that kind of highlights Moses' humility. So the, the second Passover story, when God says to these people, well, hang on, let me ask God what, what we should do for you. Here, uh, he's told about these two people who are speaking and teaching the people. Well, and Moses could be jealous of them. I'm, I'm the only one who's supposed to do this, or the official 70. Who are the two of you? But Moses says instead, no, everybody should be able to do this, and I wish everybody did. So I, I, I like this idea, uh, the kind of the democratization of, of Jewish tradition. Uh, there are certain parameters, of course, uh, in how one is to teach. And as long as one knows those parameters, then everybody should be able to teach. He shouldn't make up new parameters. That would be wrong. That would be going against uh, Jewish tradition. But if you're speaking within Jewish tradition, then anybody and everybody should be able to do that. So any, any thoughts? Or, yes, Iris, you have to unmute yourself if you have a question. Yeah, just press that mute button. Just, uh, just click on the mute button on the bottom bottom left of your screen. You can't do it. If you see on the bottom of your screen all the words, the far left says mute. All you have to do is use your mouse or cur there you go. There we go. Thank you. Um, I remember reading it. I, I don't remember where in the Bible that Moses. Uh, realizing that a lot of people had begun to worship idols again and so on, and they were kind of leaving, that he just he destroyed the the, the Jewish people only to, to rebuild them. So that that happened at um, at the gold the sin of the golden calf while Moses was on Mount Sinai getting the Ten Commandments. He starts going down the mountain with them and sees that the people are worshiping and dancing around a golden calf, smashes the commandments, comes down, and essentially, uh, with the help of the tribe of Levi, kills all the people who are uh, dancing around the, the, the idol, and then uh, gets rid of. So it's not like he's starting over with a new set of people. He's just weeding out the people who are uh, worshiping the idol, but this is this so that is was gonna, earlier. Yeah, that was earlier. Right. So this is just um, so again with Eldad and Medad, they weren't doing anything wrong. They weren't doing anything against Jewish tradition or against the Torah, as Moses had commandment. They they had the Torah says that they had God's presence had rested on them, uh, but they were just doing it in a slightly. Uh, Un informal way or different way than the rest of the elders were doing it. And Joshua wanted to, to stop them uh, right then from doing that. And Moses said, no, it doesn't matter. As long as they're teaching and they've got spirit on them, then they should do it and everybody should be able to 
to do that. I have one more. I have another question. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Why? Why was a, a, a Jewish person considered impure if they were if they had been near or touched a dead person? So the, the easy answer to that is because God said so, and I don't mean to to um, to uh, make light of that question. It's just the laws of purity, as explained in the book of Leviticus, seem random, and I don't really have a logical reason to them. So however we explain them, it's just us trying to explain it. It's, it's clear that the Torah has a particular idea in its mind as what a pure person looks like, and that a pure person does not have skin rashes on them, does not have unusual things flowing from their body, unusual discharges, or even regular discharges, and uh, contact with the dead also impacts one's level of purity. Why? Because the book of Leviticus has a particular idea in mind as to what purity uh, means, and that you need to be pure in terms of, in, uh, of trying to encounter God through the sacrificial worship system. Any of these things make us different. Uh, they affect our ability to function in a full and complete way. And if that does, then uh, we are impure and then have to go through the remedy that the book of Leviticus prescribes. Thank you. One last question. Okay, and then good. How do you do this? <laughs> You're, either your fingers can do I, it or they can't. I I'm can. not a Kohen. And, uh, either, so <laughs> you really might be able it. to teach yourself how to do it, but either it works or it doesn't. It's impossible. <laughs> Some people can wiggle their ears. I can't do that. I can wiggle <laughs> my nostrils. I can't do it right now, but I can do it. I've been, some people can raise an eyebrow just like that. I can't do that. So, and you but can I do can that. do this. All right. That's great. Okay. Yeah. That's All right. With that, um, have a good day, everybody. And, and uh, Torah, Torah study will resume um, mid, mid to late August, a couple of weeks before Rosh Hashanah. We'll let, I'll let everybody know when, uh, when we are resuming. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Yes, Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody.